And then I came across some incredible research that came out in 2002. It was groundbreaking research. And what they looked at was what makes a highly charismatic person? Like how, why are we so drawn to them? What makes them so magnetic? And what they found is that- Why are so many people socially awkward? Like why do, why do they feel so socially awkward? And what are some of the key habits that people can use today to destroy social anxiety? I love it. So I'm a recovering awkward person. Um, I think that awkwardness, it's, it's interesting. I think that awkwardness is fear dressed up. What I mean by that is when we're in interaction, we're afraid of being judged. We're afraid of not being liked. We're afraid of sounding silly. We're afraid of secrets coming out. And so that fear can dress up in different ways. And by the way, everyone's awkward in different ways, right? So some people, when they're nervous or afraid, their awkwardness makes them shut down. They get quiet, they hide, they try not to be noticed. Um, they don't showcase their true self. They literally try to disappear. Other people, they go the other way. Their fear makes them dramatic and big. So these are those folks that will name drop or show off. Like when you're with a friend, you're like, why? Why are they acting like this? It's because their fear is making them try to be impressive. And by the way, being impressive is one of the worst things that an awkward person can try to do. Wow. And so awkwardness happens from this fear and we don't know how to handle it. So I think the best thing that we can do is know exactly how to handle our fear so it doesn't turn into awkwardness. Know exactly how to handle our fear so that it doesn't turn into awkwardness. Yeah. So, I mean, like nobody's impervious to the occasional social fear, right? So what, what are, what are some, I mean, mental tricks, tactics, hacks that we can use? Yes. Yeah, so here's a study that completely changed how I think about social fear. So here's what they did in the research experiment is they brought participants into their lab and they had them walk into a, a big room of people and they flashed them from somewhere else in the room, a fear of a, a cue of social rejection. Mm. So a cue is a very small social signal and a, a social cue of rejection is like an eye roll, or a scoff, <laughs> or it could even be like a dismissive tone of voice, someone being like, yeah, great idea, right? When we know that is not a good idea. So they flashed this cue of social rejection and they found that the moment the participants spotted the cue of social rejection, their own field of vision increased. Literally their pupils dilated so they can take in more of the environment. Now what's interesting about this is this means, this gave me a lot of relief because it made me realize my fear is coming from somewhere. And oftentimes it's not even internal, it's external. It's coming because I'm spotting a cue of social rejection, which threatens our social survival, or I'm spotting a cue I don't understand. So this is the an antidote. Here's the, the way we solve this is researcher Matthew Lieberman, he's a researcher at UCLA, wanted to know if we label a negative cue, can it deactivate it? So what he did is he put participants into uh, brain scanners, fMRIs, and he flashed them a cue of fear. So a fear microexpression is one of the most contagious. When we see a fear microexpression, we are coded as humans to pay attention. So a fear microexpression, it's when you widen your eyes really wide, so the whites of your eyes show, you pull your eyebrows up and usually <gasps> take a deep breath and open your mouth. So if you were to see someone across the subway or across a crowded room doing that, you'd go, uh oh, what's making them nervous? I should be nervous too. And this is exactly what he found is that in fMRI, if he flashed a fear microexpression, people caught the fear. Their own amygdala began to activate. But here was the good news. The moment he instructed participants to label the fear, to either say out loud or say in their head, fear, the activation went away. In other words, when we know what's coming at us, even if it's negative, it puts us back into control. And I think control is even better than confidence. I think control is actually our antidote to fear. That's super interesting. Yeah. It reminds me of that saying sunlight is the best disinfectant. You know, if, if you yes. relegate an emotion and suppress it, first of all, that takes a lot of energy, which is bound to create problems down, down the, down the road. But if you face that emotion head on by labeling it is, is what you're saying. It, it, that seems like a much more productive way of, um, of dealing with it. Yeah. And also I think that confusion also creates awkwardness, right? Confusion is a form of fear. So what happens to me is I have a very specifically weird social problem, which I'm, I misinterpret social cues. So I had this problem for many years where I would misinterpret a neutral cue as negative. Hmm. So I would leave every party or every event. I turned to my husband and be like, she's mad at me. He hates me. Aww. 
And my husband would be like, no one's mad at you. I'd be like, did you see how much I disappointed her? He'd be like, no, like you're good. And so that was the first time where I was like, maybe I'm my, my decoder is off. Like maybe something's wrong with my antenna. So that was actually the start of trying to catalog all the cues that humans send to each other. I thought if I could create like a dictionary, a glossary of all the cues we send, positive and negative. And by the way, in the beginning, it started as just positive and negative. Little did I know that there was was much more nuance than just positive and negative. That put me in control. I thought, okay, if I can learn the 96 cues, I'll never misinterpret a cue or miss an opportunity. And so I think that control is also a backdoor way that we can begin to feel less socially awkward. Fascinating. It's interesting how you say that people, uh, pr- people, um, display fear differently. Like there, there are the peacockers, the ones who become very grandiose in their, in their self presentation. <laughs> and then the other ones who just kind of like withdraw, right. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Are, are these learned behaviors or are they innate in us? Like, where do they come from? Mm-hmm. That's a good question. So I'm a firm believer in nature over nurture. I think there's a lot that comes from our nature. Of course, we can learn and unlearn things, but I think a lot of our personality is innate. So when you look at the research, about 35 to 65% of our personality is genetic, and that depends on different traits. So there are five different personality traits they've studied very closely, and this is across many, many thousands of peer-reviewed journals. This is not just one little study. What they found is there are these five personality traits, and they can even identify specifically how much of each trait is genetic. One of those traits is neuroticism. Mm. So neuroticism is a really interesting trait because what we don't realize is how we worry might be innate. And here's what they found. So neuroticism is a trait that describes how emotionally stable we are. So what I mean by this is high neurotics. Surprise, surprise. That's me. (laughs) I'm a high neurotic. Okay. So a high neurotic means that we worry as an investment in failure prevention. So we think that worrying is productive, that if we're worrying, maybe we can take control of it. We also um, are much more affected by our outside environment. So we can have more mood changes. We can have more mood swings and we tend to worry and assume the negative. Okay. Low neurotics, on the other hand, are, are like emotional rocks. They're really stable. They have very little mood change. They tend to think that worrying is a waste of time. They're the kind of folks who very lovingly and well-meaningly say, calm down. Or what was it? What was one I heard the other day? Oh, worrying is suffering twice. Wow. Or why worry about it? It'll all work itself out. Or don't worry about it. I'm sure it will all be fine. Okay. So those are low neurotics because they they feel that it will all work itself out. Worrying is going to take away energy. Neither of these are right or wrong, but they are very different. What they found is that there is a reason why high neurotics worry. They can look at your genetics and tell you the very high likelihood if you are high neurotic, if you carry a certain form of the serotonin transporter gene, this gene is the gene that helps us produce and transport serotonin in our body. So very simply, serotonin, and I'm not a, a chemist, so I'm, I'm, this is just basics from the research, is serotonin helps keeps up, keep us calm. Serotonin a little bit is like the opposite of cortisol or adrenaline. So if you get a bad email and there's some bad news in there, your cortisol pumps, your adrenaline pumps, your heart races, and you worry about it until you solve it and you calm yourself down. High neurotics actually have a different response. High neurotics produce less serotonin and more slowly, which means that physiologically, when something bad happens to them, it literally feels worse. They also have a much harder time calming down. So for a low neurotic, they get a bad email. It makes them angry. They get cortisol and adrenaline. They fix it. And then they're like, whew, glad that's done. <laughs> Move on with their day. A high neurotic, they get adrenaline and cortisol. And then physically, they cannot calm themselves down. Their serotonin, the exact thing that will make them feel calm and regulated again, is slow. So that takes hours for some high neurotics. So for them, that bad email ruins their whole day. So the reason why high neurotics worry is because it literally feels worse to them. And physiologically, they actually can't recover as as quickly from bad experiences. So I think 
when you're talking about, are these behaviors learned or innate? I think if you've had one bad social experience, and let's be honest, everyone has had at least one bad social experience. I mean, high school, middle school dances for me, I still cannot go into nightclubs like from, like from the experiences of my middle school dances because they were so horrible. I feel and that. that is, yeah, right. And so I think high neurotics, we physiologically remember being in that gym with that loud music and that smell of sweat and just feeling terrible. Whereas a low neurotic, yeah, they got rejected and it kind of sucks. But at the end of the night, there was free popcorn. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it's I, it, okay. I, I wonder if um, high neurotics are prone to catastrophizing. Because that's something oh, yes. I, I would consider myself a low neurotic, the way that you were describing. Guess that's true. Yeah. I and, I, that's true. and I tend to actually be, um, I pair well with high neurotics. Like I, I tend <laughs> to make good friends with people who tend, who, who are prone to neuroticism, which is yes, interesting. This is so, okay. This is so funny because, so one is that I think that the reason why oftentimes low and high neurotics, they marry each other, they're best friends. So my husband's low neurotic. Um, my husband's, all of his friends, all of his friends, both male and female are high neurotic. Like he loves to be around high neurotics. And he says that he finds us interesting. Yeah. <laughs> like, like we have a lot of depth and texture, I guess. And also remember, okay. I don't want people to think that neuroticism is bad. Actually, both have superpowers. So low neurotics have a superpower of staying calm in a crisis. You are really good at being that rock for high neurotics. And that can give you a lot of meaning. So I think the reason that maybe you're attracted or like being around high neurotics is because what meaning is there to help your high neurotic be grounded and calm? It's like, it's a beautiful gift. And our high neurotics, we prevent crises from happening in the first place. Hmm. Because worry is my superpower. Like if I were in the Olympics, worry would be what I, what, where I would win the gold medal. That actually makes us exceptionally good planners, right? When I go into a pro program, I have plan A, plan B, plan C, plan D, plan E, plan F. And so what can happen, why, why this partnership can be so powerful is you have your low neurotic to get you through a crisis and stay grounded and your high neurotic to have every backup plan known to man. <laughs> yeah, there it's sort of like a yin and yang scenario. Um yeah. they uh I, I feel like they can sometimes serve as like the fire under the proverbial butt. They're always <laughs> like they're always like planning and trying to figure out like what's going on this evening and like what are the weekend plans and what's the next trip that we're taking. Whereas the low neurotic, yes. like I'm just chilling, like in my, you know, we're going to go I, along for it. Right. Like, <laughs> like, it, and I think this is good. Like we need our, our low neurotics to be spontaneous and try things without too much thought. We need our, our high neurotics to make sure that we have like enough water for the camping <laughs> trip that was taken last minute. And then we're wearing sunscreen. Like I truly believe that we can thank high neurotics for all the sunscreen in the world. Like yeah. really, really, truly. <laughs> I agree. My assistant Sydney is is high neurotic. I'm I'm low neurotic, and we're a great pairing, um, <laughs> pr professionally. Let's talk a little bit about uh, charisma because this is a this is a big topic mm. for you. Yes. Um, you have this like wonderful sort of like rubric to define charisma, and also to give people the tools to become more charismatic. Because charisma, would you say that it's it's like an important trait to have in the in the in the professional world? So I think that charisma is like so social lubricant. Mm. So if you can be really smart, you can have great ideas, but if you don't have charisma, it's, it's really hard to get those ideas to like be smoothly adopted. It makes all your interactions more smooth. It makes talking to your boss easier. And so in that way, I think it just makes, especially for smart people, people with a lot of technical smarts or book smarts, charisma is like this way that just makes everyone adopt your ideas faster. And so it's not only a social lubricant, it's also like an enzyme or a vitamin. I mean, I love metaphors. So, you know, forgive me, I'm just going to keep throwing them out at you, but like, you know, when you add a, a, an enzyme to something, it just activates everything faster. And so a lot of the, the problem that I see right now is that people who are very, very smart have great ideas and they wonder why their ideas aren't adopted hmm. or uh, most of our students are very high achieving professionals. They do incredible work. They're killing it and no one recognizes it. They're underestimated. They're overlooked for promotions. They can't get their raise. They work their butts off. I don't know if I'm allowed to curse. Of they, course. Work, they work. Oh, okay. <laughs> I, don't even, I don't even curse that much. So I'm just going to keep saying butts. So they work their butts off. I love that you thought and... that you thought that you thought butts was a curse. <laughs> it's very cute. Okay. Keep going. So they work yeah, their butts so they, off. They work their butts off and, um, and they don't understand why they walk into, into their, their performance review. And their boss is like, you know, I just, I don't think you're ready yet. You're not ready for that raise of promotion. 
I think the charisma is that that answer. It's that if you are not liked, if you are not seen as warm and competent, you can do the best work in the world. But if you are not recognized for that, that amazing work, there's no way that you're going to actually feel valued. So I think charisma is that really essential lubricant to get your, your, your everything adopted. Wow. So you mentioned war- warmth and charisma. Are those the okay. two essential ingredients? So I mean, I, sorry, I, warmth I, and competence. Yes. And by the way, this is like, so when I first started this research into like cues and charisma and how people see us, I thought it was just positive and negative, right? Like that's how I, I was cataloging all these cool cues and I would drop them into a positive or negative bucket. And then I came across some incredible research that came out in 2002. It was groundbreaking research. And what they looked at was what makes a highly charismatic person? Like how, why are we so drawn to them? What makes them so magnetic? And what they found is that 82% of our judgments of people that's a huge number, are based on two traits, warmth and competence. And the reason why this is important is because I think when we're interacting, we think of a lot of other traits. We want to be funny. We want to be outgoing. We want to be trustworthy. But actually, when it comes down to it, the only traits, the biggest traits, 82% of us care about are warmth and competence. So warmth, being likable, being collaborative, being trustworthy. We want to be around people who are warm because we feel that they're on our side. But the thing is, we have to pair that warmth with competence because competence is efficiency and capability. So the problem that we have is most of us have an imbalance. We're a little higher in warmth or a little higher in competence. So people who are really high in warmth without sending enough competence cues, they're seen as likable and friendly and compassionate, but they're not taken seriously. Mm. They're ignored they're interrupted. If you have high warmth. People often ask you for lots of advice and spill their guts to you, yet they won't take your ideas seriously or give you credit. If you're high in competence, but you don't have enough warmth, people see you as cold. People see you as intimidating, smart, interesting, capable, hard to talk to, unrelatable. And the research, and this is directly from the research, and this like gave me chills when I read it, highly competent folks without enough warmth leave people feeling suspicious. So this is why you have people who are off the charts smarts with amazing ideas. But if they do not share those ideas with enough warmth, people cannot trust the ideas. They literally do not believe your competence. Fascinating. How can we cultivate or or, or better project warmth if it's so important? So remember that there are 96 cues you can choose from. So the nice thing about this is I'll mention a couple of cues now, but you can kind of hand pick the ones you like, right? Like of the 96 cues, I probably only use about 80 of them, mm. right? Because some of them just don't feel very natural to me. So if there's a couple of cues I bring up and you're like, no, 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 that would be so awkward. Cool. That's not your flavor. That's okay. It's like cilantro for some people that just hate it, <laughs> right? So um, this, is, this is about creating your charisma recipe. Yes, the formula for charisma is warmth and competence, but how much of each you add is the reason why we're not all robots, right? This is why you can have highly charismatic people like Oprah versus um, Ted Lasso, right? I would say that Ted Lasso and Oprah are both charismatic. I I know Ted Lasso is a character. I recognize that's not a real person, Mm -hmm. but they're almost opposites in terms of their body language, how they show up, how you would describe them, but they're both charismatic. That's an example of like the amount of each cue that you use can change how you come across. And that's good. We want that. So warmth comes first. When we're interacting with people, before we can even think about how smart you are, how impressive you are, we have to know that we can trust you. And so all the warmth cues comes first. So warmth cues are um, things that show you're trustworthy. So for example, uh, smile, eye contact, my favorite is a head tilt or a nod. Those are all cues that warm people up. They literally make you feel acknowledged. So for example, in the very first part of interaction, you're literally doing usually five to 10 warmth cues in a row. Right. When we first meet someone, what do we do? We smile, we wave, we acknowledge them. We make eye contact. We say, it's so good to see you. We lean in, we tilt our head. Tell me all about you. What was your name? We nod as they introduce themselves. Those are all warmth cues and they typically happen first. That makes perfect sense. Yeah. And you see the, I mean, among successful people, I mean, you, you tend to, you tend to feel that um, you tend to feel the warmth. It's like these, these characteristics are pretty well conserved among people who are you know, in the political sphere, entertainers, um, it's, it's awesome. And it's great that we can, that we can sort of cultivate that. And I want to make a note also, you know, I mentioned smiling, smiling is actually not essential. 
a lot of people feel like you have to smile to be warm. That is absolutely not true. And the way, the reason why this is important is because I think that fake smiling is worse than no smiling at all. Mm. So the mistake that often people will make is they feel like they have to be smiling. And so they have this really big, fake smile plastered across their face and you just know it's not real. So that's one of those cues where if you are, if you're not a smiler, okay, do not do it. I'd rather you do the cues that feel natural to you than faking or, or giving an inauthentic smile. There's nothing worse than feeling you have to fake it till you make it. And that is something that I'm fighting against a lot in uh, my work is, no, I don't believe in fake it till you make it. I feel like be purposeful and that will help you make it. Yeah, I agree. Did you know that there's two, actually two kinds of smiles defined? Uh, yes. Yeah. There's yes. Uh, I, I, I don't, I don't do know if the... If the the du- yeah, the Duchenne smile, right? It's the yes. smile with your eyes. Yes. So it's a very warm, yes. genuine smile. And then the 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 yes. inverse of that, I've heard it described as the Pan Am smile. Have you heard totally. it ever yeah. ever just so it's basically just the smile, yeah, with the mouth and your eyes are doing nothing. It's just yes. a very fake smile. And I'll give you a third. So yes, yeah, so by the way, I'm always afraid to say Duchenne because is it Duquesne? Is it Duchenne? One will never know. I don't know. I think I think it's Duchenne. I don't know. So yes, the Duchenne smile is like, it's actually, so you can say it reaches all the way up to the eyes. It's actually the upper cheek muscles. So Mm. it's like these upper, interestingly, that's also what women tend to Botox. And Mm. what they found, this is something really interesting, is that when you Botox parts of your emotional facial expressions. So there's some muscles that don't do much for emotional expressions, but these muscles right here on the upper cheeks, those are Botox because there's a lot of wrinkles there. When you Botox those, you actually feel less happy. Wow. There's a feedback loop that we don't just feel an emotion, make the emotion. We also can make the emotion on our face and that can also trigger us to feel the emotion. So what happens in our body is if we feel happy and then we smile, but it's not activating those muscles, our body goes, I guess we're not that happy. Wow. But it happens with happiness and it also happens with anger. So I actually tried this with anger because I was so curious how it would feel. So they also found that for anger management, you can Botox your anger frowns. And this actually can help you feel less anger, angry. So the anger muscles are right here in between the eyebrows. So like you can see that I have two vertical lines in between my two eyebrows. I pinch my eyebrows together. So people will Botox those frown muscles. And they found that when you Botox those frown muscles, you feel less angry. I tried it once, lasted for about three months. I swear I felt less angry. There was something that happened where I would start to pull my eyebrows down and then I couldn't do it. I'd be like, well, can't do it. I guess I'm not that angry. Like it was the, it was the craziest thing. Now I don't like to be numb to my emotions. I like to feel them, but I think there is something interesting to think about with like the loop of our body language and our emotion. Like they're not separate. They're actually quite tied. Fascinating. Well, cautionary tale for anybody looking to get, oh. to get Botox. And sorry, I forgot there was a third kind of smile. So there's the Duchenne smile. There's the, the Pan Am smile, which is the fake smile. The last one is called a saver smile. So this is mm. one of my favorite cues. So a saver smile is a slow smile that blossoms across your face. Now there's something very magical about saying a joke or seeing someone have them go. <laughs> So you see what I mean? Yeah. You know what I mean? Like there's like, there's something like I just faked it for you. So like, I just, you could see it, but like when you see a slow smile, that's like, it just like blossoms across someone's face. It's like, a, I think there's like a child, like amazement there. Cause when you show a kid something amazing, when I show my daughter something amazing, that's exactly what she does. She has this like, <sighs> she like delights in her smile. So a saver smile is your last one, which is a slow blossoming smile. And it's our favorite. We love it. Well, how do people, I mean, some people, you know, like some interactions are just not necessarily smile inducing. And yet we still want to leave an impression of warmth and charisma. That's a, yes. And you still can. And that's like the thing is people often are like the only tool I have for warmth is smiling. Not true. There's so many other tools you have. So if it's, if you want to leave a warm impression, you don't feel like smiling, don't do it. You're actually better off doing an eyebrow raise. It was so good meeting you. I loved talking to you today. An eyebrow raise is a universal gesture of warmth. When we raise our eyebrows, it's like we're saying to someone, look at my face, or I want my eyebrows to get out of my way so I can see more of you. It's actually a compliment. Like if, if I was across a bar and I were to waggle my eyebrows at you, you would know I'm interested, right? It's a universal positive cue. Didn't matter the language or the culture. 
And so an eyebrow raise actually can replace a smile. If a smile doesn't feel natural to you, you can just eyebrow raise. Same thing with a nod. Uh, this is a little bit cultural. So in most cultures, an up and down vertical nod means yes. And a horizontal nod means no. It's different in India, Pakistan, Bulgaria. I always try to make cultural notes because most of the body language cues we talk about are universal, but there are some that are cultural. So in most cultures, up and down means yes. We love to feel nodded at. We love it. Like we, mm -hmm. when someone's nodding at us, they're saying, I agree. Tell me more. I like what you're saying. And so that's another really easy way we can add warmth is that as someone's speaking, we agree with something. We go, uh-huh, uh-huh, uh-huh. And that triple nod, they found that when you triple nod, the other person speaks 67% longer. Wow. So if you are trying to get a partner to open up, a colleague to open up, a friend to open up, and you want to show them, I am warm and I am listening to you. A slow triple nod is the best way to do it. The problem is, is you cannot do the fast triple nod. So a fast triple nod shows impatience and it means hurry up. I got it. <laughs> so here's the difference. Okay. So here's a slow triple nod. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. A fast triple nod. Uh-huh. Yeah. Uh-huh. Uh-huh. <laughs> yeah. It's, it's, so uh, it's agitated. Like <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I love this. Okay, so you've 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 shared some very important um, nonverbal cues. What about what about verbal cues? I've yeah. long been I've long believed that uh, say that a person's favorite sound to hear is that of their own name. So always mm -hmm. get their names, repeat their names to them. Also being asked questions. These are sort of like things that I've heard like a long time ago that I've just like assumed to be true. Is there truth to those? Plus one, plus one. Yes, yes, yes. Absolutely. Names, asking great questions, incredible, especially if they're open-ended questions. I would say that's level one, right? Like that's a great place to start. I like level two or like advanced intermediates. So first of all, when we talk about cues, there are four different channels of cues. So we talked about nonverbal, verbal, which we're going to talk about. Vocal, so how you say your cues, your volume, your pace, your cadence. I'm working very hard on my vocal power right now with you. And lastly, imagery. So the colors we wear, the fonts we use, the props we hold, what's behind us in our, our backgrounds. Those are all imagery cues that also signal certain things about us. Verbal cues are interesting because that is the mode of communication we think about the most right? We're going into interview. We practice the perfect answers. We're going on a date. We script out how we want to present ourselves or we script out questions. That's great. But actually what's most important verbal cues is understanding how they affect behavior. And this is especially important in professional settings. So I'm constantly thinking about how we have sterilized our communication. And I don't know if you've noticed this, but over the last few years, especially in professional communication, how much we're emailing, how much we're slacking and chatting and texting and tweeting, it seems like we've taken out a lot of the emotional cues from our speech. And so what happens is when we've sterilized our speech where there's no purposeful verbal cues, it actually creates more burnout. It makes it hard for people to engage with us. Here's an example. The kind of words we use can change behavior. So one study, they brought people into their lab and they split them up into two groups. In one group, the researcher told them, okay, everyone, today we're gonna play the community game. And then went on to explain the rules of the game and had them all play this game. It was like a prisoner's dilemma kind of game. The second group, same researcher, same room, same game, but one difference. He said, okay, everyone, today we're going to play the Wall Street game. They wanted to know if this one word swap, this title swap, would change the way people played. They found that people who played the Wall Street game shared one third of their profits People who shared the community game shared two thirds of their profits. That is a massive change with one word. And so what can happen, I think, is we end up sending calendar invites or emails or tweets that have very little cueing at all. They're very sterile. Yet, if we were to change our words to be more purposeful for how we want someone to behave and invite people to a collaborative session, not just a meeting or a brainstorm hour instead of a call or 2022 wins instead of performance review. Hmm. When we hear words like collaborative, we are literally more likely to be collaborative. When we hear words like brainstorm. We are literally more likely to activate the part of our brain that's getting ready to brainstorm. And so I think that what this is, the way that we really up our charisma is we add purposeful verbal cues to all of our important communication. Quick emails, no, but a calendar invite to a client, yes. 
An important meeting with your boss? Yes. Your LinkedIn profile? Definitely. And if you really want to like master level, that was intermediate, you tie these to warmth and competence. In other words, if you want to come across as warmer, use warmth words, happy, best, both collaborate together. If you want to be more competent, use more competent words, productive, efficient, brainstorm, power through. Every time you're using those verbal cues, you're actually triggering people to be their most charismatic self and also makes you look more charismatic. Fascinating. How can we apply this to, to like our personal lives and our social lives? I think that the best way to do this is to try to set people up for success, mm. right? So if you want your friend to show up and be open and be honest, say it, Hey, let's have an open, honest conversation later. <laughs> or, Hey, I really want to have a deep talk with you later. I got some great conversation starters. Let's, let's deep dive into it. That's actually a very easy way to begin to practice using some of these terms. I mean, obviously we're not usually sending calendar invites to friends, but even asking different questions. Like for example, instead of seeing your friend and being like, so what's up? How are you? How's it going? Which are like the most socially scripted, sterile, boring questions I've ever heard. And the thing is, is I don't know about you, but when I ask people, how are you? I get the exact same answer every time. Here's the answer I get. Oh, busy. Good, but busy. <laughs> like that. I don't know what it is right now, but when I, it doesn't matter who I ask that is their answer. Busy. Good, good, but busy. <laughs> so you're keeping them on social scripts. So instead and go on a little small talk diet. Don't ask, how are you? What do you do? How's it going? Where you work? Where are you from? All those things. Instead, ask questions that begin to cue for like a little bit of excitement. So like, what's good? Like what's good. Someone can't say busy, busy, but good. They literally have, you're like, Hey, what's good. What's been good. And they're like, Oh, what's been good. <laughs> like, you know what? Actually today I had a really great set, but whatever they're going to say <laughs> is it like, it like breaks the autopilot pattern or like my, all of my friends know that this is my shtick and they tease me relentlessly and also love it. I hope. Um, so on Mondays and Tuesdays, I always ask, did you do anything fun this past weekend? On Thursdays and Fridays, I always ask, have any fun plans coming up this weekend? And on Wednesdays, I don't talk to anyone. So like, that's just a very easy, I'm just joking. I do talk to people on Wednesdays, <laughs> but I, I'll be like, have any exciting plans this week? <laughs> do anything fun this week? So like you can even, and my friends know this about me and they, they joke with me that they save fun stories to tell me. Like they know that I'm going to ask them about their weekend and they'll be like, yes, I do, Vanessa. Yes, I do. In fact, I went to a dog parade on Saturday just to be able to tell you that. <laughs> so like it also creates this expectation that you're going to break out of autopilot and you have such better relationships for it. I love that. It People's like rote behaviors drive me crazy. Like when people respond to something or, or react to something and it makes them seem like an, an automaton, you know, yeah. uh, a non, a non player <laughs> character, an NPC. Have you ever heard that term, by the way? No, I don't know what that is. <laughs> like N NPCs are characters in video games that are just programmed in. They're non player oh. characters. So they Boring. operate according to script, like wrote their, yes. you know, their behaviors are programmed in and you'd be surprised how many people respond to a given stimulus in just a rote, like pre-programmed way. Yes. I also think that that's, that can be awkwardness acting out. It can be laziness. So like when that happens, I'm always, I always think to myself when I'm at like a friend's house or a networking event and that happens, right? Like yeah. you ask a great question, oh, you know, it's a good question. You're like, what's your personal passion project? And they're like, I don't have passions. And I'm like, <laughs> right. Like, like you, I always think to myself, okay, one, they're lazy or tired. They've had a hard, long day and they just can't, they literally just can't. They have to just scripts. Okay. Do I want to try to pull that out of them? Or am I like, bye, you know, like gotta go. And that's usually when I'm like, I'm going to go get a drink. So like, like I make that choice or they're awkward. They're introverted. They're awkward. They're shy. Can I help? Right. Can I be like, Oh, no worries. I hate passions too. What TV show are you watching? What, you know what I mean? Like we can go a different way and it's, I've tried both and that's your choice. The nice thing is you're in control, right? I think control is the secret way into confidence. And so if you know what's going to happen when you're going to get what's called NPC NPC. Yeah. Yeah. an NPC, you have a choice. 
let them be lazy and be like, bye. Or be like, I'm going to help. I'm going to, I'm going to, I'm going to take this a different direction. Ask a more boring question. Let's see where we go. Yeah. I love this. Do, do, do these, cause you, you're sharing such powerful principles with us. Do these apply for both introverts and extroverts? So I have, yes. And ambiverts, by the way, there's a third category. Very few people, interestingly, are full extroverts or full introverts. You hear a lot of these terms like, oh, I'm an outgoing introvert or like I'm a social introvert or I'm a shy extrovert. That's actually just ambivert. So there's very few people who are actually true introverts. Introverts are people who only get energy from solo time Mm. and true extroverts where they only get energy from social time, right? Like that's, those are really far extremes. Most people are somewhere in between. And what's important about that is knowing your triggers, right? So like I'm an ambivert, I'm somewhere in between. I'm actually not fully introverted. So I know loud nightclubs, loud bars, remind me of seventh grade middle school dances. I'm not going to be my best self. I leave early or I sit in the corner and I I bring my friends over to the corner. I'm very good at finding like a little nook that's kind of quiet. (laughs) Like that's my, my social superpower. But I know that about myself. And so I think it's interesting for yourself, if you're not sure if you're a true introvert or extrovert, hopefully, you know, you're somewhere in between most people are, is who makes you feel really good? So like, is that a wingman or a wingwoman? That's the person you want to hang out with and go with. Where do you feel like your best self? Is that barbecues, parties, loud places, or is it quiet places, learning environments, you know, uh, quieter environments, professional settings? And then what, like what topics get you going? You know, people tend to mistakenly think I'm extroverted. That's because I only put myself with people that I'm comfortable with in situations that I'm comfortable with at times I'm comfortable with. So yes, it sounds like I'm outgoing, but I promise you, if we were to meet at a club or a bar, you would not recognize me. Like you, mm. you wouldn't, because that's just my, that's not my trigger. I'm much quieter in those settings. What about shyness? How do we overcome mm-hmm. shyness? Because I feel like there are some people out there who, um, I, my, my, I myself included, like I, I, when I was in high school, I was a pretty shy person, mm-hmm. which was weird because I had a lot of friends. Um, but still I was, um, I, I aspired to be more social, more extroverted, And, um, and yet I couldn't get over, it took me, you know, years to get over, to get over the shyness that I felt. So really funny. I just learned this today. So a couple months ago, I put out a video on YouTube called how to be more sociable, Hmm. which is literally just how do you, I was an alternate title was going to be how to overcome shyness, but I thought let's, you know, make it, you know, about being sociable. I was like, I don't know if people are going to like this video. It is our of every video we have on my entire channel has the most engagement, meaning like people watch it for the longest and actually like stay on it for longest. So this is like a very important topic. Uh, here's exactly what I said in that video. So you don't even have to go watch it, which is here are my secret tips for being more sociable, how to overcome shyness. One, make friends in weird places. So specifically, I love a line. All of my closest friends and all my best connections have happened in line. Here's what I mean. You go to a conference. So I go to like South by Southwest in Austin every year, super overwhelming, like thousands and thousands of people. Everyone's really cool and like really cool other pants and like shiny sneakers. It's like very intimidating. So all I do at South by is I stand in line. So like there's a line for coffee. I get in the longest one. And then behind me, the person behind me, I'm like, so have you been having a fun day so far? (laughs) <laughs> heard any great speakers we're talking then the, then the person in front of me i'm like so having a fun day so far <laughs> hearing great speakers i have made so many connections just standing in line all day like that's all i do i stand on the buffet line i stand on the coffee line i love a bathroom line even if i don't have to go i'm like by the time i get to the front i'll probably have to go so i get in the bathroom line so that's been my way of being more sociable without having to feel like i have to walk into the room and be like Hey everyone, I'm the life of the party. It's not going to be me, right? I'm not going to cold approach. I'm not going to cold approach people. I don't know. I'm way too shy for that. But standing in line, I can lean over and be like, Hmm, those taquitos look great. (laughs) Right. Right. Like I can totally do that in line. Really easy openers. So make friends in weird places. Um, second is, um, always ask for advice. So like, I think that what can be hard when you're trying to break out of shyness is you're trying to impress people, which as I mentioned, the very beginning of the video, like 
there's nothing worse for an awkward person than trying to be impressive. It's so intimidating. So it's like, forget being impressive, forget even being being charismatic. I just want you to ask for advice and ask really good questions. So like, Hey, have you been to any great restaurants in downtown Austin? Hey, what speakers are you going to this afternoon? Who do you think looks good? Oh my gosh, your sneakers. They're so cool. Where did you get them? I always try to ask something that I really want to know about, but it puts me in a much less nervous state of mind because all I'm doing is looking for opportunities to ask for advice. I'm not trying to think of funny stories. I'm not trying to think of ways I can impress people. I'm literally just like, what can I ask her? What can I ask him? What do I need to know right now? That is such a more comfortable state of mind. And also it allows people to be an expert and everyone loves to be an expert. Yeah. Also a great way to pick up dates. Oh my gosh. I mean, we could do a whole video on how to get dates. That's a whole different, that's a great piece of psychology. Give me like your top three tips for getting more dates. Mm. More and better. Hmm? More dates and better dates. More dates and better dates. Hmm. I've done a lot of research on dating. Um, I'm just trying to think of like the most easy ones. Weird one, but I actually think the way that you can get better dates, like anyone can get dates, right? If you're relentless enough, you're going to get a date, but like a bunch of bad dates is not worth your time. Hmm. I believe in creating dating allergies. Interesting. By the way, I like this. I like where this you're going. Works. Like this works, which is like, if you're going on a bunch of mediocre or bad dates, or you're not even getting any dates, creating allergies creates, attracts the right people and repels the bland wrong people who are hard to suss out. So like, for example, what is something that you mention on the second, third or fourth date that people are like, Ooh, <laughs> or is often someone's deal breaker. You want to know that don't wait till the fourth date. Like don't try to convince them. I would rather you put that right up front. So like on your dating profiles in your first conversation, like give your allergy. I'll give a really weird like example. Veganism yes, that's exactly what I was going to say. Perfect. So one of my friends was single forever and she's a vegan and she would hide this. She'd be like, oh yeah, I'll go wherever you want for dinner. And like the guy would pick like a steakhouse and she'd eat like a piece of lettuce. And he'd be like, what's wrong with you? And she wouldn't say anything. They get to the second date. Again, they'd go to like a hot dog stand and she eat like a bun. And it was like this horrible thing. And so she ended up going on all these horrible dates, getting her hopes up and not saying, I was like, you need to be a proud vegan. Like you should be on your profile with a V I'm a vegan shirt, like hot. Like, so we got her real hot. She looked great. And she wore, I'm a proud vegan shirt. I don't actually think I'm a proud. I think it said, I think it said, um, it said, if, if you're not nice to animals, I will kill you. That's, I think, what the shirt we picked out for that, her. That, that is, a, that is <clears throat> right? Like, that, that is a that is an allergy, right? That either turns you on, like, gets you going, or you're like, nope. <laughs> so we, like, took a bunch of new pictures. She put that shirt on. I'll tell you, she got a lot, a lot less matches. But the matches she got were incredible. That is how she met her husband. She found another guy who was like, I love your shirt. Where'd you get it? Wow. Right, like, Chef's kiss. Amazing. Yeah. You got to put your, yeah, your allergies, put your out, like put your allergies like up front. Yeah. Almost, like, lead I, with wouldn't them. It, I wouldn't say it like it's a deal breaker. If you eat meat. No, no. Like that's super negative. Just be like, I am passionate about, even if you know, that's not going to be a popular answer. So instead of framing it as a negative, frame it as a positive and you're going to attract the right people. Right. Yeah. That makes perfect sense. Um, I love this. I mean, charisma, I mean, I feel like there is this uh, misconception about it that you're either born with it, you you're like either, you either got it or you don't, you know? Yeah. That's I used to think that. I used to think that. Yeah. I know. And look at you now. You're like a, char- a charisma. Well, you're like the queen of charisma. <laughs> I'm a recovering awkward person trying to be charismatic, which I will take. I will take, have I you, will take that. <laughs> have you choose, chosen your background? I mean, people listening to this aren't going to know what I'm talking about, but like your background is very like serene. Is there like a, is there like a, a, a reason why you picked this particular background? Oh my gosh. Okay. So I'm so happy you asked Max. This is my very first day recording here. Is it? <laughs> This is my very first year recording. So this is a brand new studio. Like literally it smells like paint in here. So I used to film in a much smaller studio, but our YouTube channel has exploded. And so I was like, what if I could design the perfect studio? And I was like, what would I want to have? And I'm like a background of trees blowing in the wind, which is, <laughs> which is what we managed to have. It's and then I was like, 
a rocking chair, but modern. This side, right? A rocking yeah. chair, but modern. And chairs. I was like, clean lines and white spaces to show presence and confidence. Which we did a triangle, which is like the ultimate uh, kind of my favorite shape. But we don't have to get in my favorite shapes. <laughs> so, so yes, but that was. Um, I've been doing YouTube videos since 2007. I've been doing a video a week since 2007. So it took 20. I can't do math. 25 years to get the YouTube studio of my dreams. And today is the first day. So thank you for saying something. <laughs> yeah, that's amazing. It's beautiful. It's, it's interesting that people can, can curate their backgrounds, their vibe. So that's it, an imagery like that. That's that. That's the last set of cues, which is, I don't know if you meant to do that, but like that, that was the, that's the final section of cues is all the props that we have in our backgrounds that we hold our fonts. Those say a lot about us. So for example, another dating tip is in your profile pictures, you should have very specific imagery cues, right? So not just what you're wearing, but what you're holding, where you are, right? If you're a big skier, you got to have a ski picture, right? That's just going to be a signal to the right people. For example, um, in my last studio, when I was, we were building the studio, this studio took about a year and a half to build. So it took forever. I was having this problem on my, in my webinars, I do a lot of corporate webinars. I got the same exact question every time after every presentation, raise a hand. Are cues universal? Oh my God. And even when I would answer it in the presentation, people would still ask that question. So I took down my entire background. I used to have chemicals behind me. Those were the cues that I was sending of like science. I took them down and I put up a giant world map. The question stopped. It was like, because I was speaking with a world map behind me, it like subtly answered the question. And so I think that the cues that are behind us, the cues that are around us, those imagery cues really do send off subtle cues. They answer people's questions about us. Hmm. Yeah, it's so true. What about when people are being dishonest with us? Because you're such a master um, identifier of nonverbal, of course, and verbal cues. But is there a way to spot somebody who's not being truly authentic, not being truly honest with us? Yes. In other words, how to spot a liar. Yeah. So deception science is, I think, incredibly important. I'm excited to have more and more research on this. Actually, in the very early part of my career, I was more focused on deception science. One of the first big experiments we did in our lab was we had people submit videos of themselves lying and we coded them. So what we did was a very simple experiment. We had um, hundreds of our readers. Thank you to all my amazing readers. We had them do a little experiment with us where we had them turn on their video and play two truths and a lie with us. You know that game, two truths and a lie? Mm, yeah. Right. So two truths and a lie, very simply, is you share two true statements about yourself and one lie. You try to mix them up, convince the person, not let the person know which is a lie. So we had people play these, these statements with us. And then we coded all of the answers. So this was, you know, thousands of data points. And we got to see there was patterns that people did on the lies. So for example, one of the patterns was actually a vocal cue. So this is why I love vocal cues so much. So I think... It's easy to lie with words. It's sort of easy to lie with our body. It's really hard to lie with our voice, mm. really hard. And so the biggest giveaway was that people typically use the question inflection on their lie. Wow. This is something that liars do. There's actually research on this that liars don't believe their statement. They know they're lying. And so they say their statement, but they ask it because they're asking, do you believe me? So the, a, a question inflection is when we go up at the end of our sentence. So every statement sounds like a question and we immediately indicate that, oh, they're unsure or they're asking. So for example, I'll, I'll play two, two truths and a lie with you. You want to see if you can guess which is the lie? Yeah, yeah. Let's do okay, it. Okay, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to use the question inflection on one. So you're going to figure hope, out which one it is. Okay. I hope I get it right. <laughs> Me too. Okay. I'm from Los Angeles. I love dogs. I'm a vegetarian. The lie would be you're a vegetarian. Correct. I'm not a vegetarian. <laughs> All right. So that's what we heard is that people would accidentally ask their lie. And that's wow. a very innate trait. And so this is really important, not just to hear lies, but for yourself. What's happening is people accidentally use the question inflection when they're nervous. And that can trigger people to think that you're lying. Mm. So what happens is you hear people, oh, this always happens at the start of Zoom calls. Like so many Zoom calls start like this. Hey, everyone. Um, today, we're going to get started in a few and we're going to talk about the new agenda and uh, let's see if we can get through everything today. Oh, 
when we do that, we're literally giving away all of our vocal confidence. And that's because people think you're asking, so you might not believe it. So I shouldn't believe it either. I also hear this. We do a ton of um, analysis of sales calls and love doing sales strategy and sales psychology. This is the reason why people get the most pushback on their prices. This is why people cannot close is they do great on their whole pitch and they get to the price and they ask it. Wow. If you ask your price, you're begging people to negotiate with you. So it sounds like this. We'd love to have your work. We'd love to work with you. This project is absolutely a perfect fit. And the price of it is $5,000. <laughs> when you ask your price, you're telling someone, I'm not sure about this price. It's a little bit negotiable. Please push back and negotiate with me. And even subconsciously, we pick up on that. And so if you have prices, timelines, important news, if you're on a date and someone asks you, are you over your ex? Don't say no. <laughs> right. So making sure that we are not accidentally using the question of inflection on things that are important. That may, it, it undermines competence. hundred percent. It, it, it literally not only undermine, con, con, undermines competence, it tips you into the danger zone. Like it's, it's literally like, burp, burp. like they found that when we hear, when they put people in brain scanners and they play them an accidental question inflection using a statement, our brain goes from listening to scrutinizing like where we listen actually changes because our brain goes, what? Hmm. Why did they just ask that? And so literally it's a way of putting yourself in doubt. If, if people are dismissing you or not believing you or underestimating you, a lot of that can do with these very, very subtle cues that you are literally giving away your confidence without even realizing it. What about eye contact? If you like look away while you're making a statement, is that an indicator of dishonesty? So there was this study, I don't even know if it was a study, but somehow an article like 10 years ago made the rounds and everyone in the world read it, which was like, if you look up to the left, you're lying. And if you look up to the right, you're telling the truth. Have, did you hear this study? It rings a bell. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh my goodness. I think it came from like NLP or something. This is not real. There is no research to back this up. In fact, we have tested this by looking at liars and coding their, dire their eye direction. When people are processing or remembering, they typically look away, hmm. right? And this can be different for right and left-handed people. This can be different based on where they typically process. So eye contact is great, but 100% eye contact is not the goal. And that has happened a lot where I think people get really bad body language advice and they're told to make 100% eye contact because it's pretty good for oxytocin. That is true. Eye contact is great, but too much eye contact. It's like, it's creepy. Right. Have you ever had someone like not break eye contact with you? It's like they're boring into your soul. So actually in Western cultures, we prefer 60 to 70% eye contact. So it's totally okay to look away and don't believe that. What is the word? Poppycock? Is that a curse? I don't know. About looking up to left or right. No, nope, no, nope, no. Nope. It's not true. <laughs> it's BS. If I mean, if you've ever done uh, like eye gazing, um, exp yeah. exp I guess oh, like they're amazing. They make you they make me cry. I cry when I do them. It's too much. I'm not into them, it's but I have much. a lot of I have a lot of friends that are that are into that. OK, so an eye gazing experiment, all it is when you make deep gaze for a long period of time. The reason why that's an experiment and a thing is because we're not supposed to do that normally, right? right? Like deep gaze, it triggers something crazy primal in your brain, it like overloads your floods your system with oxytocin. We don't need to do that on like a normal interaction. Right? Like it's like a little bit much. Yeah. So it's like 67% eye contact. We also, we produce eye contact through a webcam. So like, it's great if you're on video to also make eye contact with the camera, not the dot. Because if you're looking at the dot, you're producing no oxytocin. If you're looking at the camera, you're producing oxytocin. If you're looking at the camera, you're producing oxytocin? Correct. Yes. I'm looking at you right now, like your eyes. Yes, I'm looking at you, like the camera. You're looking at the camera. So, yes, so I'm probably gifting you oxytocin, whereas I don't have very much. Which oh, is okay. man. Yeah, because you feel like I'm not looking at you, right? Yeah, but, I, but I'm, in a, I'm doing that on purpose because... I'm gifting it to you because I want to make sure that you feel heard. I'm just talking, right? right. If we were in an actual back-to-back -back conversation, it would be much more of like a cycle. I'd be looking down, looking up, looking down, looking up. Hey, if you like that video, you need to check out this one here and I'll see you there. If we get stuck in the review and regret, we get identified with that. Like, oh, I did something wrong or that person did something wrong or whatever. And that doesn't let the healing process happen.